thanks everybody for coming to uh, this Lunch and Learn with teammates sponsored by the, the E-Club and, and, and FinTech Club here at Wharton. For those who don't know, Teammate is a venture capital group that builds uh, and backs tech companies in the areas of cybersecurity, AI, data, FinTech, and enterprise software. Uh, last year, the group launched the FinTech Foundry, with the goal to build and scale FinTech companies from scratch. Um, and we have Yval Tal, the man a managing partner of Team 8 here, who is the former CEO of Payoneer, worked at Border Free, and is leading this FinTech Foundry um, initiative. So with that in mind, um, I think we can kick it off and, and let the Team 8 team take it over. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. The, can we, we're going to jump between presentations and uh, face so we can mix and see each other. Uh, we will leave room for questions. You can jump in in the middle, but we're going to leave some room for questions at the end. And the topic we're going to talk today um, is, in my opinion, one of the most significant career decisions that uh, people make. And this is choosing where to work. In specific, is choosing a startup. So some of you are going to join the corporate world and some of you are going to join startup. Those, that's the focus we're going to talk about. And I think it's the single most important decision because if you do, do choose the right startup, that may change your destiny. I mean, never in history more millionaires have been created in the last, than in the last two years of not people who necessarily took major risks, people who just joined the right companies. And if you join the right company at the right time, you're going to be really rich. And if you join the wrong startup, you may end up spending years of going nowhere. And um, because of that, I want to focus on tips on my journey, what kind of things to look at and maybe how to improve those, uh, those decisions. It's more of a guidelines, but kind of this is the topics, right? So let's go for the first slide and kind of how I, kind of my journey a little bit. So I started two fintech companies. That's why I think we're in this club of fintech. Uh, and both of them made it to NASDAQ. So I started them and ran them. In this process, I hired around 1,000 people and let go of about 300 people. I'm obsessed about the choices and decisions that people make over their career. And I follow those people kind of continuously. So this is like many years of career and choices that people make. And I really find it to be like those little choices that in the journey and the junction that you find makes such a huge, uh, huge difference. That's why we're going to talk about fintech and startup in that um, context. So the first thing is not all positions within the startups are equal. Because if you're joining a startup and you're going to be the marketing manager, it's not as, not as bad. You may end up joining a company that had 10 people and you're going to follow them until like they have 200 people. Even if the company fails then, you're still going to have your next job after being a marketing manager for 200 people company with a certain budget. So it's not that bad. If you're doing something specific about product or you're doing something really specific to the product market fit and the company blows, then everything you did is just vanished. There's nothing. You didn't gain any, any, um, uh, any uh, assets. It's especially true for programmers, right? That's why we're using the analogy of a Silicon Valley uh, thing. And uh, so uh, programmers may end up, if you just basically writing code, it's going to be uh, demolished. CEOs or founders are in a very good position. So if you're going to start a company and you're going to fail, your career is different because you have been grown, you have been matured, you have been experienced, you've been exposed to amazing people, you raise money, you had a, it's, the, it's the best school ever. So I wouldn't feel sorry for founders who run companies and fail. That's actually in a good position. Investors typically, also I wouldn't worry about them. It's not necessarily people who would cancel the ski trip. They're typically people who manages other people's money or if it's their money, it's small portion of the money. So I wouldn't worry about it. Then they're not the one who's not sleeping. They're not the one who's spending so much time and energy on it. Um, but before we go into the journey, I think the really, really important part before you start to decide to, to go and join a startup is to spend time with yourself. And, you know, let's leave it for a second. Uh, I think I missed the slides or so about that. I'll jump into the about yourself in a minute. 
Um, and I, I, I'll explain this, uh, this uh, slide for a second. When you join a company, you would not know if the company is there with a high probability of success or low probability of success. You would know. You may have intuition, but you would not know. There are people who do. Those are professional people who understand startups, who may, may understand those uh, specific uh, market fit of that industry. They may understand the dynamic of startups. They may understand, they may be investor for a long time. There are people who do. Who do. So make sure and that we're gonna go over this in this presentation, make sure that before you join a startup, you find those people and you, ad and you identify and get the advice of uh, whether you need to join this specific company. Is this a winner company or not? Um, there's a whole, Sarah? There's a whole art, there's a whole art of uh, getting advice specific to joining startup. Like you need to find maybe investors who invest in the company. You may want inv to find investors who didn't invest in the company. You want to listen to them. You may want to find people who used to work in that company and see what they say about the company. You may want to find people who work now in the company and look at the level of excitement. It's almost like you need to be able to listen to many of the nuances. None, there is no perfect company. There's always bad things and good things and you want to look the, to all the good and bad things in the eyes and make sure that you understand what you're getting into. The only way to know it is to find people who, are, who can appreciate all of those attributes that you don't know yet. And so this is really important. Given that you're coming from Wharton, you're going to be in a position that you're going to be a very desired talent. Just joining some of those startups can, if, can change that valuation of the company. However, it may, it may not be a good fit. And if it's not a good fit because you don't know what you want and where you're heading, it's going to be a waste of time and energy for you. And it's going to be a waste of opportunity for the company. It's a serious issue. So, for example, do you, if you want to be a manager because you went to Wharton and you want to manage many people, it may not be what uh, is right for you. Sometimes you may be better in just doing business development as an individual. You don't need to manage a lot of people. So do you want to be a manager? Do you want to be a business development? Do you want to be a one-man show? Do you want to run a company? you want to be a CFO? All of that, make sure that you understand uh, your part of the deal, what you can bring and what your value and assets are at. And uh, if you haven't done it yet, I mean, go to therapy, go to, uh, to uh, ashram, go to uh, India and figure this out. It's really, really important. Next one. The, the second thing about joining, coming from Wharton with all the powers of that knowledge and, and education, there's a law that I really appreciate and I found to be very effective and very true. And this is in groups that create value. The, the number of people that makes most of the difference is the square root of the people. So if you have 100 people in a company, 10 create most of the value. And time and time and time again, in a group of people who are like, especially startups, you can identify the people that you cannot continue and grow the company without and people who you can. Not everybody have replacement. That's a very dangerous statement. Some companies in certain phases of the company rely on very small amount of, very small group of people to make the difference. And you as an individual who, individual who joins a company wants to meet those people, but most importantly, you want, you want to be one of them. The game of a startup, if you can become a critical part of the success of the company, then it's a whole different level of equity. It's a whole different level of commitment. It's a whole level, a whole different level of excitement, accomplishment, sense of creation, being part of a success. So my, my warm recommendation is if you join a company, make sure that you can make a difference, that you can be a critical part or part of the team on the cockpit that leads the company forward and make the difference. Um, the, Spending time, when you join a startup, spending time with whoever going to be your boss. So there's a phrase, people join companies and they often leave bosses, right? That's kind of the typical thing. So spend time. It's a, it's a serious dating process. 
it's the nuances over there are critical. If you're not reporting to the CEO for some reason because the company is bigger or whatever, make sure that you meet your boss boss. Listen to a lot of the nuances. Companies have a DNA. Even small companies have a DNA. What is the churn? How, many, how much people are uh, leaving or coming in? It's not necessarily a bad thing. A company with a CEO who is hire fast and fire fast is a good thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But if people joining and leaving because it's a toxic environment, you want to know it pretty early. And if you need to find people who on LinkedIn to use to work there, do it. But the companies have DNA. Spend time, go to lunches. Spend time, see what the people talk, are talking about. Sometimes the small talk kind of give you a sense of is it like there to build a product or there to complain about the food. Those little things make a big difference. Uh, it's a, this is a great series. Uh, it's old, but it's really brilliant about uh, watching the nuances. Okay. Um, it's really important to know the investors of a startup and to talk to them. If you're, if you're interviewing for a company and you are asking to talk to the investors, what's typically going to happen, what's supposed to happen is it's a privilege and an honor of the investor to speak to a Wharton graduate who wants to join a startup. So if there's any kind of friction and the CEO, the founder tell you, well, you know, that may be an indication of a friction between founders and investors. That's not a good sign. That's a serious red flag. Companies, it's very difficult to succeed if there's no chemistry between the people who run the company and the founders and the investors. So you want to talk to them. When you do talk to the investors, listen also to the nuances. So, so for example, if you ask them, will you invest in the next round? They will obviously tell you yes, but you want to see maybe how many milliseconds before they say yes. So listen to the nuances, ask them why, right? How quickly they respond to the opportunity to meet you. Those are really important uh, decisions. Look at the investors, speak with the other companies of that same VC. The quality of the investor sometimes make a huge difference on the probability of the company to get more rounds. So if it's a, 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 a Horowitz, whatever, A to Z, Anderson Horowitz, then they're most likely to get another round. They're not gonna disappear. If it's some unknown uh, small dinky VC, then that's not a good sign because they couldn't get better and because uh, or at least ask why. Why did you choose those investors? Okay, and then if it's a, it's a, it's a low, um, I guess, low in a pyramid, the VC, you may want to find out why other investors rejected that company. Those are really important uh, uh, nuances. The fourth element is the idea, right? So the good thing is idea doesn't necessarily need to be sexy. It doesn't need to be uh, cool and that you can get you excited. What's important about the idea is, in my opinion, again, this is like, I'm sure there's many opinions, but it's the market fit. In what I've seen over the years, over like thousands of companies, startup companies, if you have the right product fit in the right time, in the right market, you can screw up in many ways and you're still going to be okay. It is really important in this case to make sure that the idea is valid, that you're not trying to ahead of the market, after the market, that there is a real need. And the way to do it, I guess, is maybe try to join sales calls. See if the customers are kind of half, half asleep, doing you a favor by listening to the idea, or the customers are eager to, to get the product soon, uh, sooner than you want. Try to be just a, maybe a kind of a silent participant in some of the sales calls. Try to see correspondence with the... Uh, with, uh, uh, prospects, see number of leads, ask number of leads. But the idea itself, I mean, it's nice if you connect to, idea, to the idea, but I think it's much more important and the enjoyment is not necessarily from the idea, but from building the company, building value as a collective group. It's much more effective. And for that, you need a, a, an ecosystem of not the idea of the product, the added value, and the need for the market to actually implement it, okay? Um, this is execution. 
I cannot stress, and we're going to give some examples, I cannot stress that beyond idea, beyond very smart, intelligent, you know, all this uh, uh, Akuma, Tata, Leda, whatever, the, all the exception students, uh, uh, idea, that's great. Execution goes a long way. And there are some people who can execute and some people in these examples that are, as you can see, not going to go anywhere. And uh, and I give an example. So if you look at uh, if you look at Stripe, they came into a saturated market. There were plenty of gateway, but when they started, it's a phenomenal execution. If you look at Shopify, I mean seriously, a website for online stores. There are like thousands of them before they started. Beautiful execution. If you look at Square, Square started by selling merchant acquiring on Starbucks. It's an incomprehensible, incomprehensible. Like it wasn't even, nobody thought about it. Those dongles you could put into the old phones and you can swipe cards and get a merchant account. It was insane, beautiful execution. So finding whether the company have the execution DNA is critical. Good execution goes, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, I can't stress enough how critical it is. And there are ways to find, you can see the history of the founder, like have they done anything before? What was the, what have they done so far in the few months or a year that they're already operating? What have they accomplished? You can see the pace, you can see the, the temperament of those companies. Execution is really, really, really important. Um, the last thing is kind of personal advice. If you are joining a startup, the, and I, the upside is insane. So I think so many people, it's not that they become millionaires. Their life is, is, is changed forever. And sometimes their kids' life and their families. So when you have so much on stake, work-life balance is irrelevant. Joining a startup, it's an equity game. In the negotiation, you want to try to see that if you believe in a company, you want to get as much equity as possible and you can earn it. Don't negotiate, just give me because it's Wharton. I would say, give me because I can execute. I want to get X now. I want to get two X if I achieve, achieve those goals, if I commit myself, if I actually give up big part of the work-life balance. This is irrelevant in those situations. And find a place that you can dive in and commit yourself, and then you can really make a huge impact. I, I had multiple exits, I can tell you, it's much, much better than you think. People don't imagine how beautifully this one it work, does work out. So I do recommend to look at work-life balance as a bullshit. Um, I, I'll, explain, I'll, I'll tell, tell something about teammate, and then we're gonna open for a question a little bit. So what we do a teammate after, so it's, it's a bunch of people who already did startups and went, took it public or sold it, et cetera. And we enjoyed this um, ambiguous, uh, fuzzy phase of finding ideas and then turn them into a company. So we take a topic in FinTech, we research it until we think we have an edge. We identify people who want to be entrepreneurs, but don't have the confidence or not sure that the idea is right, right enough. And we give them a home and kiss of life and we give them money and uh, we help them if we can. So for example, two companies we built, one is uh, around uh, US taxes. So we do, uh, it's kind of a free tax uh, submission service. So um, if you, um, if you have a very simple life and you go to work and you come home and all you need to do is once a year in April to wanna, you wanna submit your taxes, we do it for you. Uh, but the business model is that uh, you're gonna work with one of the banks that we partner with. So it's a free service. We take all the liability, we just do it for you for free, uh, but you, you move your bank account to, to one of our banks and that's a very profitable acquisition cost. Um, another company we build uh, called Spot is all the e-commerce mark, uh, all the e-commerce players. They have need to have uh, general liability insurance for like Amazon or Walmart, etc. And uh, we do a one-click li general liability insurance, so you don't need to go to an agent and uh, fill up many papers. We just click here. Uh, we make it very efficient based on a lot of data that we collect on the stores. Uh, so those are two examples. That's what we do. Team eight um, and. Uh, 
we better stop here and we can undo it so we can open for questions um, from anyone. Yeah, so I think to get us started, um, ha have a, a, a few questions here. So uh, as an experienced founder can you, with, with Payoneer, can you kind of walk through the process of how you identified that opportunity? Um, like how did you decide to pull the trigger, know it was right, and what any advice you could provide for those that are interested in um, assessing those opportunities or potentially being, being founders or being entrepreneurs, um, whether in FinTech or not, you kind of like walk through how you identified that opportunity and any advice you would have um, for those that are, are, are thinking about being entrepreneurs. So I think you need to have a passion about some things, but for the most part, there's some, some basic rules. It needs to be really large market size, right? Typically, especially coming from Wharton, it's not going to be, you're not going to have a mom and pop, uh, uh, shoe store. It's going to be a institution play with VCs, etc. So you want to make sure that you're looking for something that have a serious um, market uh, size. That's pretty important. Um, you want to make sure that you have a technology play or you have some kind of edge. Just having a gimmick, a business gimmick, is typically not enough to attract VCs because the multiples on technology are so different than just a, a business gimmick. So that's there. Um, you want to have some kind of a complexity. There's some trade-off between risk and complexity. I always prefer complexity. So if you find something really complex, then that's a good thing because there's a date we're going to figure this out and then you have an advantage. If you just do just simple real estate transaction, then anyone can do it. So you want to get your edge where you're slowly limiting the number of experts in the old domain. That actually makes a lot of sense. Um, there is... There is spaces that have high multiples. There are places that have a high margin. So if you look at payments, where I come from, right? So domestic payments US with the ACH, the automatic clearinghouse is free. International cross-border payments is painfully expensive. So clearly you wanna focus on international payments. That's really expensive. Getting money in and out of China is expensive, complicated, painful, instable. If you figure this out, even now, if anyone wants who can do the China-US uh, payment solution, there's a market today, right? If you figure out payments are EV, right? So EV is gonna be huge. We know it, it's clear. If you look payments for EV, just uh, turning every home uh, charging port into a, a public charging port and you wanna charge for it. I'm just throwing examples. You clearly that's gonna happen, okay? It's complicated. Okay, so you wanna look at complicated, uh, high margin, big markets. And I wouldn't, <clears throat> I, I personally try not to romanticize any ideas. So if you wanna help, if you wanna help society, if you wanna help anything, that anything has to do with values or any kind of ideological agenda, that's after the exit, then you can donate. But for the most part, try to be pretty much as cold and as uh, disciplined into what is the right concept as possible. I hope that answers there. Okay. The, the one thing is, I would say that you have to assume that there will be some adjustments once you start. So at some point you need to dive in and hope for the best. And if you have uh, something to, to uh, kind of bite in, and you're gonna, you know you're gonna have some adjustments over time. Last thing, which I think is really important, by now, I wouldn't start a company before I have a customer, a willingly paying customer or see someone who's willing to use the product. Okay, so I wouldn't build a product for the inventory, hoping that people will use it. I would actually find either a company or individual who's willing to try it. Okay. So I think we have a question, oh, a couple questions from Cedric, but Cedric, do you want to take your first question? Uh, yeah, sure. So thank you for the opportunity to chat with you guys today. So I guess for the example regarding like prices law, I think t job titles, frankly speaking, mean very little um, in any sort of like early stage startup. So I guess framing it from a practical standpoint, obviously we'd rather be a primary contributor rather than like a secondary contributor, like one of the 10 people. Uh, how should we think about uh, signals? So whether it's job title, perhaps like <laughs> GitHub commits, uh, perhaps contributions to date, like how should we be like 
uh, smell, trying to sniff out and smell out like, hey, I am one of those 10 people. And what are those types of perhaps rules of thumb that we can use to do that? Yeah, so personally, I'm so way beyond um, letters and words and, you know, C-level. I mean, I, as, let's put it this way, as a CEO, I would give people any, any, any title that they want as long as they don't ask for more equity. So if you reverse it, the signals are on equity. Like the question you want to ask, if I do this job or better, if I become key contributors, if I do the job description as you think is as important, how much more equity will you give me? That's kind of the discussion you want to have. For the most part, I think the mo if the founder is fairly matured, his, the only discussion you want to have with him is equity. Uh, and then, then you can see that's like a very strong signal. Like a good CTO, for example, will get, you know, two, three, four percent, depends when they join him. If they give you 0.01 percent and if you behave well, you may get, uh, you know, lunch for free. That's not a good signal. Okay, so that's kind of this. Super helpful. And I think just along, um, so Fred's question and mine sort of dovetail, but Fred can definitely jump in. Um, so Fred's question was around the lines of, um, if there's an idea in the market that's not already well executed, like how should one proceed? And if you've never been a founder or entrepreneur, like how do you evaluate the chance, your chances of success from an execution standpoint? And then sort of my question along the same path is really about if you have not yet been a first founder, how, how does one think about like cutting your teeth? like joining a startup first an employee as an employee? Is it a good idea? Is it a bad idea? Like how to actually like think about that and what are the perhaps, you know, maybe top three, top four things that we should be considering. But those two questions are sort of along the lines of first time founders. So if you have it in you to be a founder, like that's the question you do have, how do I know if I have it in me? That's really the, is that there? Maybe I'll let Fred, Fred, Fred have his question first. So, so we can okay. kind of take topics together. Fred, feel free to jump in and I can, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I think that's about right. It's, it's sort of, you know, there are lots of ideas out there that are just not well executed, but you know, who am I to say that I'm the best executor? So I guess, what do you do, you know, to sort of test your, sort of your own, your own fit as being able to execute the idea. And do you stand a chance in these areas in which, you know, like you mentioned, like Shopify, there's a, there's a million different websites, but how do I know that I could potentially do it better? Is there anything that I should be thinking about or doing, or do I just not stand a chance? So I, I break the question. You're asking two questions at the same time. So the first question, how do I evaluate my idea? And the second question is, how do I know if I have it, whether it's execution or stamina or just um, whatever the charisma to get the people around me. And that's, uh, so let's do two questions. The first thing is, on, on the product itself, the market, the fact that there's already well-executed pro companies doesn't mean a lot. I mean, if there weren't any companies, then why? Like, like how come nobody from the seven and a half billion people didn't think about it? That, that doesn't make sense. I mean, especially, right, so this is Philadelphia or Silicon Valley or New York, right? So someone is in the space already, it came across. So that's not, that's, it, competition is not a bad thing. And if you look, all of the successful company came into a saturated market. All the companies I mentioned, including even Google, including Facebook when it was my, I mean, most of the successful companies have already established themselves on the experiments of the early, of, of the other companies, even if they were already public and successful. So that's not a bad thing. Um, but I would research a lot on that space. I would talk to customers. I would talk to potential partners. I would... I would find on LinkedIn anyone who's willing to talk to you. I mean, I would spend months of researching, understanding the market, understanding there's like this curve of knowledge. I would go through all the curves until you feel that you understand the space inside out. You know the companies, you know the weakness of the companies, you speak to ex employees. I mean, spend the time before you commit yourself and spending, I mean, years and, and it's all your pride and, and it's really, I mean, you are back at the wall. Once you start, you can't really stop. Once you take money from people, you are committed. This is not, uh, I mean, if you look at the bacon and egg thing, so you're the pig, you're not the chicken. This is, you're on the, on the plate over there. So once you take money, so before you take money from people, spend the time seriously to investigate. As far as knowing if you have it in yourself, I think the, 
a good indicator would be what your friends think about it. So sometimes your friends already know you're going to be an entrepreneur and you don't. If you look at the history, right, so all of you made it into a Wharton, so you already have serious validation through high school and, uh, and bachelor's and, uh, I mean, doing this to get in. So you're already starting from a pretty important competency point. But look at other extra curriculum or extra thing that you've done. Even if you organized the best parties or you did your marathon or whatever exception that you did, it's a pretty good indication if you have it. If you're just a boring person that did never, never did anything interesting in your life, then go do something extreme and then come back to be an entrepreneur, right? So educate yourself. That's kind of a, okay, but, um, but the topic of whether you have it or not is a huge one. Because sometimes the overconfident, incompetent, stupid people, but because of their extra competence, they go out and they just convince everybody and they raise money and they're really not there. To, they're not the right material to be CEOs. And that's damage for everybody. So you need to, uh, going back to the Buddha thing, uh, it, I think it's important to take the time to learn if you have it, if you have the drive to do it. Okay, the work, if you're really important about the work-life balance and you wanna wake up at 11, with your little coffee, and then start your day? Maybe not. Okay, that's, uh, I hope that helps. Um, but more people than, I think more yeah. people than, more people than they think, have it. More people, I mean, I think, I, I think there's many, many people who go, go to their 50s, and they feel a huge miss, that they didn't commit themselves and did something serious. They waited too long, and there was like, uh, mortgage, whatever. So I'm encouraging people to be entrepreneurs more than, at least experiment on it, yeah. I think so that's I, a good transition for you, for you, Cedric. Yeah, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, super helpful, because I kind of had the same question, but uh, so for most of us who perhaps aren't as, or, or let me rephrase that, probably more risk averse. <laughs> so if we wanted to kind of, uh, join a company first to kind of like get the experience under our belt um, prior to starting something, you know, perhaps some of us are coming from like a corporate background and haven't actually had the first quote unquote, like, you know, first time startup experience. Do you think that's a bad idea? Do you think that's a good idea? Perhaps some rules of thumbs that we should be thinking about. Um, uh, this is more for ones that are planning on soft stepping the jump to entrepreneurship as opposed to kind of just jumping right in. So, you're asking me, right? So I, I don't, it doesn't mean that it's a right answer, but I will take the position of the entrepreneurs. Life is not a dress rehearsal. I, I don't encourage people to have many, many steps before they jump in. What you say that you're risk averse, I'm not sure if we have a discussion, what is the risk, right? So the risk is much more of an ego and uh, I guess self uh, perception or dealing with rejections or whatever. It's not so much, I mean, it's, this is not, I mean, riding a bicycle on the mountains may be more dangerous than, there's not, the risk is really perceived risk. So first I would encourage you go and practice on rejections. Whatever your means are, go out and use whatever apps to get some rejection. You'll see it's not that bad. Um, and uh, so there's a, the, the, the first thing is like, what is the risk here? The second thing, it does make sense to spend some time on a, on a startup because it will give you the language and the terminology and the pace and the way your business is done and you know, how to kind of first get the first customer. So potentially, if you're joining a startup and, if you, and you are in the cockpit or part of the team that had to navigate through it, it may give you some experience, but I wouldn't give too much point on it. Like you can do it for a year or you can just watch... Uh, um, Silicon Valley, whoever made Silicon Valley, I mean, the only people who laugh from the Silicon Valley are people who are not entrepreneurs. Anyone who went through this is a horror movie. It's a horror series, right? This is like everything over there is absolutely true. It's just made funny. So it does make sense, but I wouldn't do it too much. Just basically at some point you need to jump, okay? But I would say one more thing, right? Because of that insecurity that you mentioned, because it's risk averse, whatever, and I'm, I'm just jumping on what you said, there's nothing, uh, of course, personal, but what people also often do is they say, I'm not smart enough, or I'm not charismatic enough, or I'm not uh, 
technical enough or I'm not business enough or something. And they go and they find a team. Now you have three people. And that's more like, um, it not, it's not necessarily that you need them, but you just need them to feel better that you may not be able to do it yourself. My recommendation over there is go back to therapy, see that you have it in you. Go and investigate the idea enough time Build a company, just register the company in Delaware or do whatever, okay? Do some demo with, uh, I mean, Ukraine is out, but find a place to do a, some kind of a build a demo uh, and then find your partners. What's going to happen then is you're going to have a much more stable uh, partnership. It's not going to be 30% 30 each. It's going to be you're the entrepreneurs, you have two partners, and then the the... Tyranny is clear, and I do believe in tyranny. So, I mean, tyranny for businesses is, is, a, is a very healthy situation because decision can be made, and you don't need to actually spend uh, so much energy on just maintaining the relationship. So that's why I would say uh, those are the common mistakes. Go study, and then start a company, and then find partners, and just don't think too much of it. If, if you know what you're doing, if you understand the materials, if you know it inside out, there's a whole industry of people who just want to give you money especially coming from Wharton. Awesome. So I think the, another good question is from Cardiff. So I can read it, or if you want to jump in, feel free to jump in. You can go ahead, Alex. Thanks. Okay. So a common recommendation for joining a startup is to find the right founders. How would you go about researching the founders? What things would you look for? What are some red flags? Um, yeah, so I, I, I take what I said before and I'll expand it. Um, there is a, there is the courage of finding people that are better than you. And if, if you want to find a co-founder, then identify people that you think there's no way this person will ever work with me. Like, why would he ever even talk to me? Those are the people you want to look for if you have go back into the insecurity if you find someone that is a nice peaceful uh, yes, yes man guy then it's a it's a disaster because at some point money comes in and he's going to make capricious random decisions but if you find someone that you really look up to that you feel like it's an honor to have access to that dimension those are the people you want to have both as partners also as an employees and that takes courage it's like i don't know dating a supermodel like how do you even reach that level of like how do you how do you not mumble when you start talking to them those are the people you want to you want to find i think that's kind of the best best advice i can give um and then there's a level of appreciation there's a level of respect there's space to uh really give. the second thing is and this is red flags is to look at the emotional intelligence um it's a, it's a pretty intensive uh, relationship and you're going to go through a lot of evolution and you want to make sure that the people that you work with are business wise mature, that you can talk through issues, that you can go through a lot of friction intensive situations and go through them and, and grow with them. And I think that's, that's the other. Last advice is spend a lot of time with him. Don't jump on the opportunity. Don't get too excited. Even if they're superstars, don't get too excited over the opportunity. Find a way to spend time to massage the thing, to negotiate. A lot of, a lot of the personality is going to come through the negotiation. And I go back to the beginning of the things. If you can create a situation when there's enough assets before you have another partner join, then you have some kind of differentiation, and that's much more stable. So even if they join the board, even if they have a lot of equity, but the decision making is not based on equality. Okay, that's really. I don't know many companies that uh, the founders, as equal founders, survived. Well, we know Google, but for the most part, those partnerships don't survive. It's almost like you have expiration date the minute you have that bond. Okay, so for the good and bad. Great. So uh, another uh, thing you recommended in terms of assessing the startup that you might join is uh, the importance of product market fit. So Poppy asked, um, 
what are some good ways to understand or identify if a product has um, product market fit or is on the path to uh, achieving it? And so it may not be clear from the information that you have, particularly if they're like pre, you know, very, very early in the product development. So there is common sense and you can tell the stories and you spend time with the team. Um, the best way is to actually join sales call. So if you hear customer says, when can I get it? If you hear, let's say, look at the, if you look at e-commerce, right? So you look at the e-commerce and you know that e-commerce need funding. I'm looking at FinTech. Anyone that have an Amazon store, it will be limited by the amount of money they have liquid, liquid. So they can buy more inventory. Anyone there needs to have a solution for advertising. So you know that there is a need. You talk to them and if you join a company that they have a very elegant way of providing liquidity for e-commerce sellers, you know there's a good market fit. There may be many other wrong things and maybe the model is right and maybe they may lose a lot of money, but there's a market fit for that product. So that specific question is, and you want to talk to the, um, there's no better way than to talk to customers, potential partners. I think it's legitimate to ask a company before you join, especially coming for a, for a key position, is to quietly join sales calls or to listen or to see if they're recorded sales calls. Or you can find people in the industry and ask them, is that a good thing? Um, we see, I mean, we, we see a lot of ideas and companies and, uh, um, you just know, sometimes you know. You just listen to it, it makes sense, you validate, you ask a few people and then, then you know. Right? Sometimes it makes no sense. Sometimes, I mean, you look at the idea, and you're like, hmm, it's gonna be a challenge, okay? Sometimes, you know, it's a, the, pro, the, the, the it may be a very cool product, but the acquisition cost is gonna be so high and they never thought about how to deal with the acquisition cost, so you know something is really wrong about the product market fit just because they didn't think ahead on, on everything or the amount of money you're going to need needed to uh, execute is so high that it's become a very high risk. So it's a multiple, uh, there's no easy answer for it, but I was just spending more time getting a, you're getting you a better intuition to what it is and asking more people. Just to be fair, there is no perfect company. So you need to be able to be prepared to see that the market fit have high risk in it and it's okay to take the risk. It's never going to be wow, okay? I mean, think of the risk that Tesla took, right? The company was almost under multiple, multiple, multiple times. If, if uh, Mercedes wouldn't save her, there was no Tesla anymore. So they took huge risks. It doesn't mean that the market fit, but the electric car is uh, obviously uh, amazing risk. Talking about execution, Tesla is, I mean, just, it's a, it's a monumental, I mean, this is, if there was a Nobel Prize for execution, well, um, I hope that answers. So there is no good solution, but you just spend time and, until you get the, the feel. Awesome, thank you. So uh, the next question, kind of like switching gears a little bit, because we've talked about ways to identify whether to join a startup, but um, what are some signs that you should think about leaving a startup? Um, how do you assess, um, you know, what's a good time if things are going rocky, how to assess if it's a temporary struggle or more of a systemic, uh, problem within the company? Yeah. So the reason I would leave a company very quickly is when you have a unresolved, unsolved issue between the founders or between the founders and the investors. I think the reason why companies fail more than any other reason combined is when the uh, founder, I guess the shareholders doesn't get along. So that's there. So if you have two or three founders and they hate each other or they don't talk to each other, that's, I mean, don't even try to fix it. That's gone. There's something about, if you look at real estate, so real estate, if there's dispute, then the building is standing still until the dispute is over and then you continue and what you lost is maybe the interest or the potential rent that you could make, but you can continue. If you look at a startup and there is a conflict between shareholders, the value becomes zero very, very quickly. Okay, uh, so that's one. If you see there's a toxic, uh, uh, toxic uh, culture, so people are mean to each other, people are leaving because they are being abused, uh, in a non-constructive way. I, I don't believe in being so spoiled, but 
like for no reason, just being abusive, then life is too short. Okay? Depend what position you're in the company. So sometimes you don't have the privilege to live so quickly. But if you just join a startup to learn because you want to have a practice, don't, uh, don't think too much. Okay? Uh, I would say, to be fair, to be honest, if you think of leaving, talk to the founders, tell them, if this and this and this is not fixed, I want to leave. Be fair to them. Try to fix the company. In other words, there's a balance between saying, hey, that's not, a, that's my, not, not my company, I don't want to spend time here. But because you already have equity and you're part of the company, I think it's fair to say, I want to fix it. And be assertive enough to try to fix it. Okay? Whatever the problem is. And then you, because it's a small company, you have to, and again, coming from you know, higher education, then the, the founders or the CEO will listen to you. So say, we need person, this person to be replaced. We need this person to be promoted. We need this person to, whatever the solution is. Okay? Sometimes CEOs will make um, mistakes in the form of cementing, cementing mistakes. So they hire the wrong person and they, they're not bad enough to let them go, but they're not excellent. Those are the, those are the company killers. And if you see it, you can tell, go to the CEO and tell them, listen, this person is fine. He's a good guy. But if we have him, if we replace him with someone who's extraordinary, then the company will take off. And if we don't make this, this change, it's going to be a mediocre, boring company, and I don't want to spend more time. So it's sometimes it, this kind of being brutally honest uh, is really important, and try to fix it before you leave. Okay? I think also try to be mature about what is annoying and what is fundamentally wrong with the company. Sometimes, you know, just it's too intensive. They call you in the middle of the night. This is, this is not a, this just is annoying. This is not a bad thing. But if uh, people are passive aggressive or a customer calls and nobody answers him for a few days and that's part of the culture, then it's not going to last. Okay. Um, awesome. So I think we have uh, time for one more question and you kind of touched on um, equity from a as part of the uh, decisions on how you think about trying to um, help fix a company but uh, we have a question from David that was how would you think about a company's current valuation as you think about potential companies to join because equity is one of the early benefits today's funding market it seems to be already priced in it may be harder to achieve equity on the upside so what is the role of evaluate? How should you take evaluation as one of the assessment criteria in choosing what startup to join? So, I mean, valuation is created by investors willing to pay the price. So someone took the time and uh, the VC are typical, fairly professional teams, and they decided to invest in that valuation. The details are the important one. So what I would ask from a company again, finishing Wharton, is I would ask for the liquidation preference. I would ask, it's not the valuation, it's the liquidation preference, right? So I'll, I'll be a little bit technical here. The valuation may be $100 million. But if the company is sold for $200 million, the employees can get nothing because of the liquidation preference. Because if the employees have like a, whatever, 2X, whatever the terms is, right? Then I, th I think you, have, you must have courses about uh, venture capitals. So... The liquidation preference of the investor is more important than the devaluation itself. It's not a single dimension question. So you need to ask for the terms of the investment if it's okay, and then learn all of it and maybe use a lawyer who understands it to understand exactly what you're getting into. Right? So again, many, many companies, especially now in the 2021, when companies ask for like whatever price they want, then you can pretty, pretty much be assured that the last investors have preferences over any other previous investor. And if the valuation goes down as they are going down, many people, many investors, and many employees will get nothing. Just the last investor will get their money back or part of it. So you need to be worried about everything, not just the valuation. However, and this is the good side, if you join a company, it's almost like you don't care much about valuation, what you want to be able to negotiate and say, if I'm as good as I think I am, if I'm becoming a critical part of the company, I want to have the open door to come in and ask for more equity 
especially based on adjustments of price. Don't be upset if I will show up in, in the door within six months or a year after I establish myself as a critical part and I'm going to ask for more equity, okay? I think it's much, it's kind of fair for both sides. Don't negotiate just because you have the pedigree of Wharton. Negotiate because you can execute, because you bring value. And then it's a, it's a win-win and then it's, it's easier to negotiate. Most CEOs say, fine, of course, come to me in a year. And in a year, guess what? It's going to be a very different discussion because you're not showing up like out of nowhere. That's my, I guess, the best advice. Just take whatever it is, learn what you have, and then, you know, try to negotiate as much as you can. But when you finish negotiating, ask for permission to get more equity once you become a pivotal part of the company. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, we have about four minutes left. I want to just leave some time if you wanted to, because I know you're hiring uh, and obviously uh, the MBA is like to get hired. Uh, could leave some time for you to talk about um, the open roles that you have if you want to. Otherwise, we can wrap up the conversation. So I think the best thing is my uh, my LinkedIn is Yuval Tal, Y-U-V-A-L, and last name is Tal, T-I-L. I do accept friends from Wharton. Um, so, uh, please feel free. I think the best thing to do is reach out on a personal level and we can take it from there. What we have is many companies we establish here in Israel, but the market is us, obviously like the company with the taxes and the company of e-commerce. So immediate, the market, the immediate market is us. And we are constantly looking for people in the U S to start the companies with us. So we can have technology here from the military and all that stuff. Uh, and then the market and the access to market and all the. Uh, business development, sales, marketing, product, etc., cetera, uh, done in the US. So um, by all means, I invite you to reach out on LinkedIn uh, and then we will respond to all of you, anyone who's going to reach out. So that's, I guess, the, the best thing. And we are looking to, of course, find. The, the other thing is people, if you have ideas in the fintech space and you run random with us, that's like, that's what we do. So um, there was a question about how do you know if the idea is valid? valid? then contact us, we, we do it for free, we do it with you, uh, we investigate the idea, if it makes sense, we try to work out something, if not, then at least you have the validation that you needed. All right, so that's there. Okay. Awesome, all right. Uh, well, thank you again for the time, this was super informative. Um, and uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Um, so yeah, I, I, think we, I think we can close there. Good luck there. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.